and express uh, my appreciation to Brother Wayne Price for the efforts that he has expended in uh, developing and grouping together this series of meetings. It has called for a considerable effort on his part, and often those efforts appear to be uh, unappreciated by those that are close to us. And I want uh, personally, Brother Price, for you to know that they have been appreciated, very much so. And uh, they have been honored furthermore in my judgment of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose Father, it is said, takes note, deliberate note, of those that fear the Lord and who often speak together of his name. It is said in Scripture that their names are written in the book of God's remembrance as he takes note of it, and he has noted these discussions. And whether you have uh, been persuaded of one side or the other, whichever it is, it is your interest in the truth that God honors, and I honor it. And I commend you for being part of these, uh, for these gatherings. <clears throat> Tonight, my proposition as has been stated, is the scriptures teach that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, does actually, bodily, literally, and in his own person dwell in the individual Christian. <clears throat> By brief definition, what I mean is this, that the apostles' doctrine, with no verbal modification, instruct us that the Holy Spirit himself dwells with us. Doctrine with no verbal modification, instruct us that the Holy Spirit himself dwells with us. In accordance with our arrangements, uh, I have five questions to share with Brother Woods. I will uh, read these questions for your own Knowledge, question one, do you accept the fact that the Holy Spirit himself has personal contact with your spirit? Question two, what is the meaning of 2 Peter 1.19 where we take heed to the word until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Question three, do you require the intercession of Christ at the right hand of God in addition to the scriptures? Question four, are baptized believers really sons of God or only figuratively? And question five, you acknowledge that the Holy Spirit was in Christ and that he was in the apostles. Where is he now? <clears throat> I want to affirm tonight at the outset of this that the Holy Spirit of God is not only a person but that he cannot be divorced <clears throat> from his person. That the indwelling of the Spirit is the issue of this debate, not the mode of the indwelling. That in fact the indwelling is itself the mode, just as baptism is itself the mode. Indwelling is a mode. There is no mode of indwelling. For instance, Brother Woods is a personal entity. In his writings, he infuses his mind.
but his writings are not to be confused with him. He is separate from what he does. Thus do I distinguish that the Holy Spirit, while not separated from his person, is distinct from what he does. We are not discussing, in my understanding tonight, what the Spirit does, but where the Spirit is. I maintain now that this is a fundamental part of that blessed new covenant ratified by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which covenant is once again enunciated in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 15 through 17, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now I maintain tonight that the Lord cannot write his laws upon our hearts without getting into our hearts. That he does not write them there by proxy, but by the Holy Spirit that this promise I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts is the functional description of the Holy Spirit indwelling the believer. The fundamental issue here is associated with the new covenant and that indwelling of the Holy Spirit is seen as the means of implementing the new covenant. Now, my beloved brother Woods, whom incidentally I have come to love during this debate, while it may not appear so to those unfamiliar with this sort of thing, those that love and honor the Lord are to be highly esteemed for their work's sake. And I honor my elder brother. I do not honor his position in this matter we are discussing, but in no way is that to impinge on my honor and respect of him. I wanted to make that clear. Brother Woods acknowledges that Christ and God and the Spirit dwells in us. He says that there is no issue there. I say there is an issue there. My question is, if you believe that God and Christ and the Spirit dwells in the believer, why don't you preach it? Why don't you proclaim it with as much zeal as you neutralize it? Why not side with David and with the Apostle Paul that said, I have believed and therefore I have spoken. I am proclaiming these truths, not necessarily expanding these truths. Since these are not obviously being declared by others, I intend to declare that the Holy Spirit dwells in the heart of the believer that he cannot be conceived as dwelling there impersonally because the Holy Spirit is a person. I am a person. A person cannot dwell in another person impersonally. I want to take a moment here to interpret the term in you. There is some considerable question about what this means. And so we have appealed to lexographers and various commentators about the word in, the Holy Spirit being in you. I, for one, will not call upon the lexographer. I will not call upon a commentator as venerable as they may be, but I will call upon the Lord of the church, Jesus Christ himself, who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, who has been exalted above every name that's named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come, and under whose feet angels and authorities and powers have been made subject. John the 14th chapter and verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. John the 17th chapter, verse 21 through 23. 
that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved the Father. Now I maintain that Jesus and his spirit is in us to the same extent or in the same sense that the Father is in the Son. To the same, in the same sense that the Son is in the Father. That this is what Jesus prayed. Thou in me, I in thee, they in us. I will not repudiate that wonderful statement of the Lord. If it be a dark and mysterious statement, that is the difficulty associated with those that embrace this darkness and difficulty. Jesus has said it plainly. The Father's in him. He's in the Father, and we are in them. The indwelling of the Spirit, as I have mentioned, is after all the issue, not the mode. I want, with all due respect, to give what I have called here, for sake of emphasis, the gospel according to Brother Woods. I do this cautiously, for I mean no reproach. It is the position that I am attacking, not the person. And I desire to speak evil of no man. Romans, the eighth chapter and verse nine says, Ye are in, ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit dwell in you metaphorically. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you metaphorically. Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts metaphorically by faith. 1 John 4, 12, God dwelleth in us metaphorically. 1 John 4, 13, we dwell in him and he in us, metaphorically. 1 John 4, 15, God dwelleth in him, metaphorically. 1 John 4, 16, he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him, metaphorically. 1 John 3, 24, hereby we know that he dwelleth in us, metaphorically. 1 Corinthians 3.16, the Spirit dwelleth in you, metaphorically. 2 Corinthians 6.16, I will dwell in them, metaphorically. On and on we could go. It's obvious God did not say that. And I trust there will not be a high degree of intoleration with me if I refuse to accept that. It appears to me that it is unauthorized for any individual to bind on another. Something he thinks God said. He, he cannot bind on me what he thinks God meant. You can only bind on me what God said. God said I will dwell in them. I say take it as it stands. Don't say, well, do you mean God himself really dwells in us? Well, if he doesn't, why did he say it? Do you mean to tell me Christ really dwells in us? Well, if he doesn't, why did he say it? He said he did. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You believe that. He didn't modify it. Neither can I. The assertion that he does not dwell in us personally or in his person is a contradiction of terms. We say tonight, that Brother Stoner is in Marlow, Oklahoma. Now, if Brother Stoner was to send to Marlow, Oklahoma, a piece of literature that he had written, and we laid it on the back table, we would not say that Brother Stoner is in Marlow. It was his word that was in Marlow. 
Brother Stoner is in Marlowe when he's in Marlowe because he's a person, not a thing. And the Holy Spirit is a person, and he is where God says he is. If he says he's in your heart, he's in your heart. If he says he's in you, he's in you. If he says he dwells in you, he dwells in you. And I don't believe God has as much difficulty with speech as some would have us suppose. Brother Woods knows that the word of the Lord declares that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. There's no question about that. But he modifies what the word says. I am now to make a very strong allegation. I am going to say that to modify what God says is to deny what God says. That to add words to what God says is exactly what God says it is. It is adding to his word. And it is a jeopardous situation. The kingdom of God is a progression. It is never retrogression. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Progression. We are changed into his image from glory to glory. Progression. We go from strength unto strength in Zion. Progression. The revelation of the law was greater than the sparse messages of the patriarchal age. And John the Baptist enlarged upon the message of the prophets. And Jesus proclaimed a greater message than John the Baptist. And at Jesus' commission, the apostles opened to the largest extent the glorious gospel message. And glory itself will be greater than grace is now. Progression. It has ever been the mode of the kingdom. Noah had more than Adam. And Abraham had more than Noah. And Moses enlarged on the Abrahamic concepts. And the prophets exposed more of the mind of God than Moses. And John the Beloved identified the Lamb of God. And Christ and his apostles brought the Father closer than he'd ever been before. Progression. It's of unspeakable magnitude. Always been the case of the kingdom. The church began with the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Baptized believers were promised the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit himself bore witness with their spirits that they were the sons of God. They were given by the Spirit to know freely the things given to them of God. There was an unparalleled quickening Godward. The love of God was shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost. Their bodies actually became the temples of the Holy Spirit. And then the apostles died. The generation that had tabernacled with them passed away. And in the words of our teacher, the power passed from the person to the book. And now in the day of salvation, in the enemy's territory, where we are assaulted by the remnants of sin in our members and in jeopardy by the adversary of our souls from without, we are left with only a book and our natural resources. If in the energy of self we can figure these things out and conform to them well, but if not, we are in danger. We must do so without an indwelling spirit, without being personally joined to the Lord, without him dwelling in us. I maintain this takes the good out of the good news and robs us of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. If this is the case, we are no longer partakers of Christ. We have not been made partakers of the divine nature. We are no longer changed from glory unto glory. He does not personally dwell with us, and we are not the habitation of God through the Spirit. If this represents the case, venerable brethren, and I emphatically deny that it does, for the first time in the history of this world, for the first time in God's dealings with us, his manners are characterized by less intensity, less involvement, less ministry, less benefit. For the first time, the living God has reversed himself into retrogression. 